When parents send their children to school, often they don't know what happens day to day. Parents rely on what their children tell them about how they are doing and what they are learning. Generally, schools will host parent-teacher conferences at least twice a year. Parent-teacher conferences are short meetings between parents and their children's teachers. Usually, parent-teacher conferences are held when teachers give out a student's grades for the term. The parent-teacher conferences give teachers an opportunity to let parents know how their child is doing. A teacher will let a parent know the student's strengths and bring to the parent's attention any problems with grades or behavior. The meetings also offer parents the opportunity to ask questions and see what their child is learning. When it is almost time for parent-teacher conferences, the school will send parents a note and usually give them an appointment time. There are appointments during the day and in the evening. Evening appointments are used for parents who work during the day. Parent-teacher conferences do not last very long. Normally, they do not last longer than 10 minutes. This is why it is important for parents to make sure they arrive at their appointments on time and come prepared with questions. If a parent needs more than 10 minutes, he or she should try to schedule another meeting with the teacher. Keeping a teacher for more than 10 minutes when there are parents waiting is disrespectful. Most children do not go along with their parents to the meetings. This allows both the parent and teacher to talk honestly about the child's progress without making the child feel bad. Usually a teacher will offer advice to the parent on how to support their child's education. Driving in the U.S. can be confusing, not just because of all the rules and laws that drivers must follow, but also because of driving customs. Many people in the U.S. are really dependent on their cars to get to work and school. In fact, most American workers spend an hour driving to work each day. In order to drive in the U.S., you have to go to your local Department of Motor Vehicles first and take a written test to get your learner's permit. If you pass this test, you can practice driving so you can pass a road test and get your license. The Department of Motor Vehicles, or DMV, has free booklets you can go and get to study for your learner's permit. You can also access the information online and even take a practice written exam. To prepare for the road test, you can have a friend teach you to drive or pay to take classes at a driving school. You cannot, however, practice driving by yourself. If you're caught driving with only a learner's permit, you can get into trouble with the law. Once you get your driver's license in one state, you can use it to drive in all of the United States. Wherever you drive, you will see signs posted along the road indicating the speed limit. These numbers are not a suggestion. Generally, you can drive faster on a highway than on local streets. Local police use special equipment to detect your speed. If they detect you are speeding or driving over the speed limit, police can stop you and give you a ticket. You will have to pay a fine and some of the fines are more than $100. The lines painted on the road are not just to keep cars in their lanes. They send a message. For example, a double solid yellow line means that it is against the law to pass another car here. The self-portrait is nothing new. Painters and photographers have always used themselves as subjects. Today, however, almost everyone walks around with a camera in his or her pocket, this is because most cell phones have cameras on them. The fact that most people have cell phone cameras with them all the time has led to the rise of the selfie. A selfie is a self-portrait usually taken with a cell phone. Since the pictures are usually taken on a cell phone, many people tend to share these photographs with friends and even strangers on different social networking websites. Some of the popular social networking platforms people use to share selfies include Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. People usually take selfies when they are engaged in normal day-to-day -day activities. They take selfies of their commutes to work or school. People take selfies of themselves eating. Other people take selfies to show what they are wearing or whom they are hanging out with. The most common way to take a selfie is by holding a cell phone at arm's length. Some people take selfies by taking a picture of their reflection in a mirror. In these pictures, you can usually see the phone the person is taking a picture with. Selfies taken using a mirror 
often are taken in a bathroom, which some people think is offensive. The bathroom is a very private place, not a place to take pictures. Some people think that selfies are a sign that people are becoming vain or superficial. It is not often that people take pictures of themselves that make them look bad. When people take pictures of themselves, they usually are trying to present themselves in the best light. However, some people use selfies to show what they really look like. Some people are trying to challenge stereotypes of what makes someone attractive. In U.S. cities like New York City and Los Angeles, many people live in small apartments. Despite not having homes with big yards, some apartment dwellers still seek the companionship that domesticated animals like dogs and cats offer. Some people feel that having a pet even in a small space is good for teaching children responsibility. However, many landlords forbid tenants from having pets, specifically cats and dogs, because of the damage the animals can do to carpets. Some landlords even forbid birds because of the noise they make. Many landlords charge an extra fee, known as a pet deposit, to tenants who want to keep pets. This is to pay for repairs or cleaning caused by the pet. Many times, apartment dwellers will choose animals, like fish, hermit crabs, guinea pigs, or hamsters, that make little noise, little mess, and won't chew up the furniture. Other people keep lizards as pets, since they don't require much space and can be kept in small cages or tanks. Another benefit of these smaller pets is that they don't need to be walked. However, some people who live in apartments have pets that are not so ordinary. Some of these less-than-ordinary pets include mammals like hedgehogs, amphibians like frogs, and spiders like tarantulas. Not all exotic pets are legal, though. In order to maintain public safety, some cities and states have laws banning specific animals as pets. New York City, for example, bans people from keeping ferrets, snapping turtles, pythons, and scorpions as pets. It seems unlikely that a family would have a polar bear named Fluffy or a whale named Bubbles as a pet. New York City has specific laws banning these wild animals from residences. These laws exist for a good reason. In 2003, a man in a Manhattan apartment was discovered to have a 350-pound Bengal tiger as a pet. It is very common to see homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles. This is a problem that has persisted in the city since the beginning of the 20th century. Back in that time, California was known for offering many job opportunities in farming, and many young men were hopping on trains from all over the country to arrive in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, many of those men often ended up finding themselves without a job, a place to stay, or even food to eat. To help these people, many churches began to establish shelters in the area of Los Angeles that would eventually become downtown. Even as the farm landscape changed to a big city environment, these shelters remained a refuge for many individuals that found themselves homeless. Nowadays, the homeless population of Los Angeles is made up of much more than just young men looking for work. Many economic and social changes have resulted in both men and women of all ages turning to the streets of Los Angeles. Some of them are there as a result of substance abuse that has left them moneyless and jobless. Others are veterans from various wars that cannot find the resources to get back to their normal lives. Additionally, many of these people suffer from mental disabilities that limit them from finding a job or being accepted in the rest of society. Since there are a lot of different causes that lead to homelessness, it is easy to see why finding solutions to helping all of the homeless people is so difficult. Although there are many programs that focus on providing the homeless food daily, it is much harder to find programs that try to assist the homeless in finding jobs and stable housing. In order to finally find a solution that will effectively help decrease the number of homeless people in the city, a lot more individualized attention must be placed on individuals based on their physical and mental health and circumstance. Some of the everyday heroes in the United States are the country's paramedics. These young men and women are usually the first people who respond to medical emergencies suffered by citizens. 
Paramedics must complete a very extensive physical training program that is designed to weed out those who cannot make the cut. A paramedic must be in fit condition and be mentally strong to perform his or her duties in the face of danger. Many of these heroes must endure life-threatening situations when responding to emergencies. Paramedics are usually attached to a county or city fire department, but there are also some private paramedic organizations. In Southern California, there are two primary schools for paramedic training. They are UCLA's Daniel Freeman Paramedic Program and the Paramedic Training Institute. Both of these schools provide candidates for the Los Angeles County and City Fire Departments. To become a paramedic for a county or city organization, candidates must also pass a psychological screening and a physical training program. Some of the equipment paramedics carry is very specialized. They carry basic and advanced life support gear, such as forcible entry tools, so they can reach people in peril, saws to cut through obstacles, and other emergency equipment. Paramedics provide a valuable service to the communities they serve. They must be certified in cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, techniques, and be trained to handle all situations. Some paramedics are trained to respond to what is called mass casualty incidents, MCI. These emergencies occur whenever there is a tragic event such as the September 11th, 2001 attacks on the country and other emergencies like earthquakes, mudslides, or floods. Paramedics can also be sent to emergency situations by citizens who call the 911 emergency phone number. Halloween is on October 31st. It is also called All Hallows' Eve or All Saints' Eve. This is because, according to some, the holiday has its roots in a Christian holiday that remembers the dead. Others say the holiday has its roots in the ancient harvest season traditions of Ireland. In the U.S., though, the focus is less on memories of the dearly departed or agriculture. It is about kids dressing up in scary costumes and going door-to-door -door asking for candy. This is called trick-or-treating. When children knock on the door of a house or ring the doorbell, they usually say trick-or-treat. The trick part is a fake threat, signaling that the kids will commit a prank if they aren't given something delicious. Homeowners then give the children candy, raisins, or some other food treat. Many homeowners decorate their houses to prepare for the holiday and let kids know that they are participating and can ring the bell for candy. Traditional decorations often include jack-o'-lanterns, which are pumpkins with faces carved into them and candles inside. Jack-o'-lanterns were thought to scare away evil spirits when Halloween was first celebrated among the ancient Christians. Also, turnips, not pumpkins, were originally used. People often decorate using the colors black and orange. Halloween is not just for kids. Adults get in on the fun by attending costume parties. There are often contests for who has the best costume. There are also games bobbing for apples where people have to get an apple using only their teeth from a large bucket of water. Other people celebrate by scaring themselves by going to haunted houses, homes where people dressed up as ghosts, zombies, and werewolves and jump out to frighten guests. People also tell scary stories or watch horror movies. Taxes are special fees charged by a government on the people who live in a country, state, or city. These fees help pay for public services like police, road and bridge repair, and public schools. In the United States, people have to pay national, state, and local taxes. Income tax is a tax applied to how much money a person earns in a year. There are both federal and state income taxes. These have to be paid every year by April 15th. There are special forms the Internal Revenue Service, IRS, the government agency in charge of collecting taxes, asks people to fill out. There are tax credits that people with low income, college students, and parents can get. These credits could mean actually getting money back from the government. This money is called a tax refund. People can get both a federal and state tax refund. Anyone who works has to be taxed regardless of the immigration status. Not paying income taxes could mean a fine or even jail time. 
Payroll taxes are taxes that are taken right out of a person's paycheck. There are federal and state payroll taxes. These include Social Security and Medicare taxes. Social Security taxes pay for the retirement and disability benefits received by millions of Americans each year. Medicare taxes pay for the federal health insurance program that covers the elderly and the disabled. People who own houses pay property taxes. The amount paid depends on how much the property is worth. This tax is usually paid once a year. Sales tax is a tax almost everyone pays. Sales tax is a specific extra percentage charged on nearly all purchases. Everything from soap to furniture has a sales tax attached when bought. The amount of the sales tax is different across states and cities. Health insurance is one way to pay for health care. Health care includes visits to the doctor, prescription medication, and emergency services. People can pay for medicine and doctor visits directly in cash, or they can use health insurance. Health insurance usually means you pay less for these services. There are different types of health insurance. At some jobs, companies offer health insurance plans as part of a benefits package. Individuals can also buy health insurance. The elderly and disabled can get government-run health insurance through programs like Medicaid and Medicare. There are many different health insurance companies or plans. Each health plan has a set of doctors they work with. Once a person picks a plan, they pay a premium, which is a fixed amount of money every month. Once in a plan, a person picks a doctor they want to see from that plan. That doctor is the person's primary care provider. Obamacare, or the Affordable Care Act, is a recently passed law that makes it easier for people to get health insurance. The law requires all Americans have health insurance by 2014. Those that do not get health insurance by the end of the year will have to pay a fine in the form of an extra tax when they file their income taxes. Through Obamacare, people can still get insurance through their jobs, privately, or through Medicaid and Medicare. They can also buy health insurance through state marketplaces, where people can get help choosing a plan based on their income and health care needs. These marketplaces also create an easy way to compare what different plans offer. If people cannot afford to buy health insurance, they may qualify for government programs that offer free health insurance like Medicaid, Medicare, or for children, a special program called the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP. These days, many people attend community colleges with plans to transfer to a four-year college or university to get a bachelor's degree. It's kind of like a stepping stone. There are many reasons why people do this. One reason is that some community colleges have transfer agreements with private and state colleges and universities that guarantee admission. Even if a community college doesn't have that agreement of a guaranteed spot in a four-year college, it has articulation agreements with four-year schools. These agreements tell you exactly what classes a student in a community college needs to take in order to be able to transfer. These agreements make sure that students don't waste time taking classes that won't transfer. Most of these classes one needs to take before transferring are general education classes, like math and English. Another reason why many students start their undergraduate degree at a community college is a financial one. A four-year college or university is much more expensive than a two-year college. This is especially true for immigrant students who don't qualify for financial aid, loans, or scholarships. Also, community colleges tend to offer more evening classes so they can accommodate people who have to work while attending school. They are also a good option for older students with families who need a more flexible schedule while taking care of children. Community colleges also tend to be commuter schools, meaning people don't have to live on campus in dorms. Attending a community college means you can still live at home with your parents, which can save the family a huge amount of money. If a student didn't do well in high school, a community college would provide him or her with another opportunity to enter a four-year university. Community colleges offer many classes to help students develop their math and writing skills. When you attend a four-year college, you are expected to have those skills already. Community college will prepare students to successfully graduate from a four-year school.
Most children in the U.S. begin school at age five when they go to kindergarten. This is the beginning of elementary or primary school. Most children stay in elementary schools till they are about 11 years old. Elementary schools are divided by grades. The youngest children begin in kindergarten at five and then go to first grade, second grade, and so on. Most elementary schools go up to fifth or sixth grade. The focus of an elementary school is basic academic and socialization skills. Mostly, children learn how to read, write, count, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Students also learn the rules of English grammar, spelling, and vocabulary. Children also learn basic social studies or history, science, art, and music skills and participate in gym or physical education. In elementary schools, children also learn how to follow directions, share, and work in groups. Students usually stay in one classroom all day with one teacher who stays with them throughout the year. Students may leave the classroom to visit the school library, the school gym, and attend special science, art, and music classes. Students also usually leave the classroom for lunch and recess. For lunch, students sit at tables separated by a grade in a large cafeteria. Recess is usually a half hour when children go out into a yard to play. The typical school day starts at about 8 o'clock in the morning and ends at about 3 o'clock p.m. Students go to school from Monday to Friday and have the weekends off. Elementary school teachers are licensed by the state where they work. They have to graduate from college or even graduate school taking special classes in early childhood and elementary education. Before teachers can be in a classroom with students, they have to pass a background check and take an exam.